Hello, my name is Rebecca Folkerth and I'm a neuropathologist in Boston. I'll be giving today the topic of neuropathology of the central nervous system, an update. There are many advances in the past decade, not all of which uh, we will have time to discuss, so I've chosen three here in the uh, fields of neurodegenerative neuropathology, in which we'll be focusing on the role of misfolded proteins, uh, neoplastic pathology, uh, with the advances in molecular classification of gliomas, and on the topic of demyelination, specifically the gray matter pathology that's been noted uh, more recently. Starting with the neuropathology of neurodegeneration, the modern era of research has ushered in um, a host of understanding about discovery of protein aggregation underlying diverse disorders, and these include familial, sporadic and acquired, or transmissible diseases, uh, examples given here are tau in Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, beta amyloid in Alzheimer's disease, alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease, diffuse Lewy body disease, and multiple system atrophy, ubiquitin in PIC disease, and polyglutamine repeat disorders uh, in Huntington's disease, uh, spinous cerebellar atrophies, and Kennedy disease, and the role of scrapie prion protein in prion disorders and we'll go over a couple of these. This is a busy table, however, uh, it's only meant to indicate the vast array of disorders now that have been recognized as protein aggregation disorders, uh, and the toxic protein is listed here on the left, where it's deposited here in this column, uh, and whether it's a familial disorder here, and which genes are known to be mutated. Some are not known at this time, but most are. Uh, and whether these are also occur in sporadic disorders as well. What is common to all of these disorders is the phenomenon of protein aggregation, and this is uh, diagrammed schematically here. Normally, native proteins have a three-dimensional configuration, uh, which are uh, often in a random coil, but that produces the most uh, ex expeditious uh, protein function. And depending on specific uh, genetic and environmental factors, which may influence the conversion of these to misfolded proteins uh, and the capacity of the cell to, through molecular chaperones, return them to the proper protein state, this is an equilibrium that exists. If, however, this goes out of equilibrium, there is an accumulation of misfolded proteins here. And what happens to these in the normal cell is that they are either degraded in the phagolysosome system here uh, and undergo autophagy, or they're ubiquitinated and they enter the proteasome pathway where they are uh, broken down into peptides which can be recycled again to form uh, uh, other native proteins and be reused by the cell. If there is a failure of these two mechanisms, however, these misfolded proteins can accumulate and uh, oligomerize together and form beta pleated sheets, which can only partially be degraded in the proteasome system uh, less effectively, and therefore can accumulate even into larger pools, which can form fibrils, uh, which are also beta pleated sheet structures. And these uh, can accumulate in the cells in various places. In the polyglutamine repeat disorders, the proteins accumulate within the nucleus as intranuclear inclusions. And in um, some states they will accumulate instead in the cytoplasm as intracytoplasmic inclusions, for example, neurofibrillary tangles or Lewy bodies. And then in some instances they will actually aggregate outside of the cell, uh, for example, senile plaques. So the types of protein aggregations that we are able to see uh, in neuropathology preparations, and these in particular are autopsy sections of the brain, include a, a beta, amyloid beta, which is in Alzheimer's disease. In each of these, the immunostain is, uh, results in the accumulation of a protein which is detected by a brown chromogen. So the abnormal protein is brown in each panel. Here, the A beta is accumulated in the uh, extracellular space here in the neuropil. And here is an, a, a core of amyloid, and this is a senile type of plaque. In frontotemporal dementia uh, with um, chromosome 17, 
the tau is the accumulated protein, and it occurs in neuronal cells here. And you can see the outline of a pyramidal neuron. There's also some accumulation of the protein in the neuropil surrounding it. In Parkinson's disease, the typical targetoid accumulation uh, forms this Lewy body, which is a, a haloed structure here. And this is present in a pigmented neuron of the substantia nigra. This is the faint nucleus here. And these are neuromelanin granules. And this is the protein deposition here. In Huntington disease, the polyglutamine aggregation is seen as a smaller dot-like inclusion within the nuclear membrane here. And in ALS, it's present uh, as a ubiquitin, shown here, in the cytoplasm next to the nucleus. And in Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, the abnormal scrapey prion protein accumulates as these extracellular aggregates in the uh, neuropil. This is an example from the cerebellum. These are the granule cells here. So each has a characteristic appearance depending on the protein and the cell type that's involved. Further uh, uh, appearances include uh, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, in which the tau accumulates in what are called globose neurofibrillary tangles. They can also accumulate in what are called tufted astrocytes, which form these nice um, uh, fuzzy shrub-like structures. Uh, and again, this is in a neuron, but this is in an astrocyte, so the accumulation is not always just in neurons. Here, in fact, are what are called coiled bodies in oligodendrocytes, and these are present in uh, PSP and also in some other disorders, including grain disease. And this is in the white matter. In uh, corticobasal ganglionic degeneration, one can also see balloon cells, very typical on H&E. These contain abnormal neurofilament proteins, and they also contain tau here in a, in a less dense uh, aggregation. Again, the astrocytic plaques can be seen in CBD with uh, processes containing the accumulated protein. And if, uh, as was done in this original publication, one does double labeling for tau, here seen in red in these processes, and glial fibrillary acidic protein uh, in green, one can see that the merger of the two forming a yellow signal indicates co-localization of tau in astrocytes. And this was a novel finding at the time of astrocytic uh, inclusions. Again, the balloon cell of corticobasal ganglionic degeneration, uh, which is positive for neurofilament protein, can be distinguished from the balloon cells or the uh, expanded cells in Pick's disease by the presence of tau in Pick's disease and the smaller size of the inclusion. And again, the characteristic um, localization of where in the brain these things are found. Accompaniments include cell loss. For example, in the substantia nigra, this is extra neuronal pigment from where a pigmented cell such as this used to be since it has died and left behind the pigment and gliosis in the background. This is another characteristic feature. In addition to this change, one will also see alpha-synuclein accumulating in the neurites uh, in the background, as well as in the Lewy bodies, which we've seen before. This is the H&E appearance of a Lewy body. Again, this is normal neuromelanin pigment in the pigmented cells. And this is the uh, chromogen reaction product for the immunohistochemical stain. Even though they both look brown, they are uh, different substances. In addition to cortical, uh, or, I'm sorry, Lewy bodies in the substantia nigra, one will often find cortical Lewy bodies in the diffuse Lewy body diseases. These are less uh, well developed and more difficult to see. And for these, we rely heavily on the alpha synuclein immunostain, which again shows these inclusions in the cortex. The interest in these disorders has led, and particularly in Parkinson's disease, the, the interest in the distribution of these has led to a theory that uh, there may be a, a progression through a stereotyp stereotypic pathway from uh, early stages of the disease to later stages of the disease. And this was an idea put forth by Brock some years ago.
And he has proposed that the earliest changes that one will see in Parkinson's disease will be in the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus and also in the raphe nucleus, as well as in the locus ceruleus of the pons, which is not depicted here. Whereas over time, one then begins to <coughs> excuse me, see aggregation of Lewy bodies in the substantia nigra in the midbrain, which would make this a stage three, and then stage four in the amygdala, nucleus basalis of Minert and hippocampus, which are not shown in this diagram. And then the latest stages of disease, disease would show aggregation of the protein in cortical neurons, as, as seen here. Now, the question is whether these just re represent stages of severity, or as we'll discuss later, whether these could actually represent propagation of the protein through these anatomic sites via their neuronal connections. If we look at disease susceptibility loci for Parkinson's, and, and again, this is more of a model for uh, the protein aggregation neurodegenerative disorders as an example and is far too detailed for the amount of time that we have here. Uh, but I want to present the concept that there are certain mutations, for example, the alpha-synuclein mutation, that confers a greater risk of disease than some others and leads to earlier development, earlier in age, development of symptoms, uh, and these tend to be familial. Whereas some are, have a less uh, disease susceptibility function and may instead uh, be more due to sporadic environmental or perhaps unknown genetic variant factors. And so that, that explains the spectrum of disease that is seen clinically and, and across the genotypes that are seen here. Uh, and again, I will not go into the detail about these many genes. They're uh, being discovered basically all the time. But if we do look at the ones that are present in this table here, we can see that they occupy a couple of different uh, chromosome sites. They have varying protein functions and clinical phenotypes. And consequently, they also have different pathologies, including um, uh, where these inclusions may be found. So that, as a neuropathologist, one of the things that we uh, are interested in is sampling widely the various areas that we know to be involved in different neurodegenerative disorders, applying these various protein stains, and then in, a, in conjunction with uh, evaluating the clinical history, we can come up with the most accurate diagnosis of the cause of the patient's neurologic disorder. A model then can be generated, and this again, the example I've chosen is Parkinson's disease, but this is also applicable to other neurodegenerative disorders in terms of how we can think about um, progression from the protein abnormality to the expression of the disease. Here in this case, alpha-synuclein uh, related to an abnormality and mutation, the uh, uh, alpha-synuclein gene leads to the presence of the pro abnormal protein in the cytoplasm, accumulation to the point of toxicity and development of a Lewy body. This may also uh, lead to neurotoxicity on the basis of mitochondrial response, uh, which can be influenced by uh, genetic susceptibility genes, as we've seen in the previous slides, leading to oxidative stress, which can also secondarily affect the uh, function of the cell. Another example of a tauopathy that I would like to discuss now is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is a new tauopathy among those that have been known for some time. Uh, this is uh, work that's been done in recent years uh, by Dr. McKee on primarily athletes who have suffered trauma, repeated trauma, uh, and have come to autopsy. And these are whole mount sections of one hemisphere going from the frontal lobe posteriorly to the occipital lobe, showing, again, an immunostain where the brown staining indicates accumulation of tau protein in specific sites. And one can see that it tends to be accumulated down at the depths of sulci, at least in some portions of the brain. Note also that there is a heavy accumulation in the amygdala and also in the hippocampus, uh, among other sites. <clears throat> 
these are sections, again, highlighting the uh, accumulation in the depths of sulci here. And what one can see is the presence of the tau protein aggregated in neurons and also in astrocytes. And note the perivascular proclivity for the protein deposition here. And also there are, is protein out in some of the neuropel out in the processes. Uh, it's still unclear whether these are neural or astrocytic or both processes, but uh, showing this uh, diverse uh, accumulation of protein in the brain in what is considered a characteristic pattern. The first consensus criteria for CTE uh, was a conference that was just held two months ago, and one can find the um, report of the consensus meeting with the uh, initial consensus criteria on the NINDS website. And what was determined by the group of, uh, of neuropathologists who met for this was that there was a, uh, a set of required findings, supportive findings, and then ones that, if found, would be exclusionary for the diagnosis of CTE. And the idea of this is that as we go forward and begin to study these cases uh, excuse me, systematically, and as we encounter more and more um, cases in the general population, not just in the athlete population, but also in civilian and especially military populations, we will have a way of grading these uh, with criteria which uh, have been used, for example, in the pathologic diagnosis of Alzheimer disease over the years. So the required criteria are, as I've shown you, an abnormal accumulation of tau in neurons, astrocytes, and cell processes in an irregular pattern in the depths of the cortical sulci. What's also supportive of this is if on macroscopic examination one sees a cavum septi pellucidi or a fenestrated septum, third ventricular dilatation, or other old injury, for example, old contusions, this would be supportive of the uh, diagnosis of a chronic traumatic encephalopathy. One also seems to more characteristically find tau in the layer two to three neurons and in the CA2 and four neurons of the hippocampus and in the deep gray nuclei. This is in contrast to Alzheimer's disease in which tau accumulates in the deeper layers in CA1 and the subiculum and not so frequently in the deep gray. Another characteristic or uh, supportive feature, uh, not entirely pathognomonic but supportive, is the presence of subpeal and subependymal thorn-shaped astrocytes in CTE. Now, if one finds uh, abundant amyloid plaques or CA1 disease with hippocampal sclerosis, it's probably more appropriate to consider a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it is true that there are cases that have features of both, and in subsequent meetings of this uh, pathology group, uh, more, more refined uh, criteria will be developed to separate these entities. If there is severe basal ganglia involvement, one should uh, instead consider the diagnosis of corticobasal ganglionic uh, degeneration. And if there's cerebellar dentate involvement along with some other features, one might consider PSP rather than a diagnosis of CTE. So this is a, a fast-moving field and uh, should be interesting to watch over the next few years. Another thing that was found in chronic traumatic encephalopathy, besides the tau, which is shown here in the substantia nigra in, in the olfactory bulbs and thalamus, is the presence of the protein TDP43, which is, uh, again, shown here. This is a protein that has been seen in other disorders. It's a recently recognized player. It's been found in ALS, as you can see here, uh, in frontotemporal lobar degeneration, where rather than being present in the, in the nucleus, it translocates into the cytoplasm, which is an abnormal place for it to be. And here it's shown in a fluorescent preparation as a bullet-shaped inclusion in the nucleus rather than a diffusely staining um, presence in the nucleus. And then it's also present in the cytoskeleton in ALS. This is a very important protein. It's um, involved in RNA regulation, so it normally is present, as I say, in the nucleus. Uh, 
where it, it's important in stabilizing the presence of um, the mRNA as it goes from being uh, uh, transcribed to being uh, out into the cytoplasm in the mRNA. So if there is an abnormality here in the TAR DNA binding protein, TDP43, then one will develop abnormal accumulation of the protein. And one can see here that in FTLD, the TDP43, a gel probed for that, shows these abnormal accumulations of fragments of TDP43 outside of the normal uh, uh, band that one would see in a normal cell. It's not clear whether it's a gain or a loss of function of this protein, uh, but it's in an abnormal place in the cell and it's associated then with a secondary accumulation of other abnormal proteins. So to summarize the potential mechanism of toxicity in these protein aggregation disorders, we have the accumulation of these uh, proteins, beta pleated sheets in the example of amyloid. These cause an inhibition of the ubiquitin proteasome system, can disrupt axonal transport, result in synaptic dysfunction, can increase excitotoxicity, result in protein sequestration, which means they're not usable for other functions of the cell, can result in mitochondrial dysfunction and further oxidative stress, and be, uh, with the example of the TDP43, may affect uh, gene transcription and ultimately result in apoptosis and cell loss. As I mentioned before, there's been a recent interest in thinking about how the staging of these protein disorders occur, whether it's just a sequential uh, difference in the um, susceptibility of different areas that, for example, the dorsal motor nucleus of the, of the vagus is more susceptible to accumulation of alpha-synuclein and therefore accumulates it earlier than other sites, say in the cortex and in, in Lewy body disease, or whether there's an actual mechanism by which the protein as it accumulates spills out into the cell and can be taken up by adjacent cells and therefore spread from, using this example again of Parkinson's disease, from the region of the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus up in a monosynaptic fashion up into cortical sites as seen here, or for example in Huntington's disease from the caudate to the cortex and in Alzheimer's disease through the limbic system, as you see here. Um, and possible mechanisms by which this could occur would be that the protein aggregates actually uh, either by uh, uh, membrane rupture or by exos uh, active exocytotic mechanisms can end up in the subarachnoid, I'm sorry, in the uh, uh, pericellular space, um, and that they could then be taken up by adjacent cells, for example here, just by adjacent cells, or whether you actually have transfer through uh, from one cell to another by direct uh, membrane fusion or by uh, synaptic transport as seen in other disorders. This is an open question and is of great interest uh, and has led some investigators to liken these protein aggregation disorders to Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease as uh, um, a uh, sort of non-infectious protein propagation uh, mechanism. So to summarize, there is a wide spectrum of neurodegenerative diseases that have in common this accumulation of abnormal protein. It can be neuronal and glial. It can be nuclear, cytoplasmic, or extracellular. And it has distinctive distributions throughout the brain, which we in neuropathology use to help us uh, identify the disorder. The genetic basis of these is rapidly evolving and uh, contributes to the overall understanding of the development of these. The question of propagation and transmissibility remains open. And we hope that greater understanding of these will lead to some targeted therapies of use to patients in the future. Now I'd like to switch to uh, discuss the neuropathology of malignant gliomas and some advances that have occurred in the last several years in this field. We're all familiar with the appearance of glioblastoma with pseudopalisading type necrosis and high cellularity. This is a, a uh, terribly malignant tumor which has had little improvement in outcome since the brain tumor study group recommended XRT and aggressive surgery many years ago. Chemotherapy is a very limited benefit and there are really 
no phenotypic features that predict response to therapy in an individual case. Some early genetic and epigenetic findings were, have been found to have p predictive and prognostic value. For example, in oligodendroglioma uh, in 1998, it was determined that loss of heterozygosity for 1P and 19Q predicted a response to treatment and was therefore uh, indicative of a better prognosis in patients that had an oligodendroglioma. And here is an example of an anaplastic one here. Now, this is quite cellular and also has some vascular proliferation. So in some cases, particularly in a limited biopsy, one may have some difficulty distinguishing it for, from, for example, a high-grade glioma such as a GBM. So that to be able to do fluorescent in situ hybridization to detect this particular change was really useful diagnostically and very helpful to the patient prognostically. In GBMs, uh, an, an epigenetic finding that is, the methylation of the MGMT promoter uh, predicted response to alkylators, and this has also been a very important uh, finding, which is in, uh, has translated to utility in the clinic. And I'll show you some examples of how these uh, studies are done. So fluorescent and in situ hybridization entails hybridizing cell preparations with probes to particular sites. So for here, the probe is in green, is to chromosome 1P, and this is to an unrelated centrosome. And here, the red is for chromosome 19, uh, for the uh, long arm of chromosome 19. And you can see that in this particular preparation, there's loss of one copy of 1P, so there must be a whole deletion of 1P and there's loss of 19Q. So this would be called a co-deleted, 1P19Q co-deleted oligodendroglioma. And this, as I said, has allowed uh, distinction of relatively chemo-responsive oligos from unresponsive gliomas and has been the standard of care for many years now. With uh, high-grade gliomas, looking at MGMT promoter methylation, uh, here's a the original study that was published in 2005 setting the stage for what is also now a routine test. And here, these, each one of these is an individual glioma. Here, these are peripheral blood lymphocytes, which are a control. They are normally unmethylated. If these are passed through a methylation chamber and are uh, methylated, then they are a positive control here. Uh, and you can see water should have neither thing here. So among these tumors, these two here, have methylation of the promoter, and these two cases here are not methylated. And what was found that uh, among those cases with methylation, so these blue cases here, uh, this indicates silencing of DNA repair, so that these would be susceptible then to alkylating agents. So this was predictive of response to chemotherapy. And if one separates these out, the methylated here in blue versus the unmethylated Looking at, a, uh, at the probability of overall su survival, one can see a uh, distinctive, it's, it's limited, but this is not bad for, for a glioblastoma uh, a benefit compared to those that are unmethylated. And this becomes even more pronounced when one stratifies these according to whether they also received radiotherapy and temozolomide. Um, in the methylated versus the unmethylated state. So the unmethylated, even when they're treated, do poorly, and the methylated, when they're treated, do better, especially those that have both uh, radiotherapy and temozolomide. Further analysis in recent years of uh, human brain tumors was kickstarted in the early mid-2000s by the NIH with the formation of the Cancer Genome Atlas Research Network, or the TCGA. The mission of this was to provide a network view of the pathways altered in adult malignant gliomas, and they focused primarily on GBMs for several re reasons. Number one, it is the most common primary brain tumor. It's historically refractory to all therapies, as I've recently shown you, except for those that uh, are methylated. Uh, has a high morbidity and mortality with a median of one year survival, and already had a number of important genetic events defined, although these had not so far yielded uh, druggable targets or uh, prognostic features 
other than those I've already mentioned. There were 71 component institutions, uh, some with several research scientists contributing, and this was a, a major effort that was published some years ago. Part of what came out of this was the finding that among GBMs, there were frequent genetic alterations in primarily three signaling pathways. One is the RTK RAS PI3 kinase pathways, shown here, the P53 pathway, and the RB signaling pathway, shown here. And as you can see, some tumors must have both because these are uh, overlapping numbers. So in this diagram, the red indicates activating or amplified uh, genes, blue is inactivating mutations, so mu mutations where they're knocked out, and the shade here indicates the degree. So for example, EGFR was very strongly uh, involved in a high number of cases, whereas these others were involved somewhat less. Uh, P10 is, is mutated in a high degree of tumors, uh, NF1, and so on. And so that you can see that these, depending on whether they're knocked out or overexpressed, result in proliferation and survival and uh, tumor advantage and tumor progression. If we look at the heat map that was generated uh, as a result of these analyses, one can see that in the core samples of the TCGA, which was 173 glioblastomas, uh, which were uh, examined for these different um, genetic aberrations, you can see that they roughly fall into four basic types based on their expression of, uh, of these various markers. So in this case, red is overexpression and green is loss. So that you can see, for example, in the classical, there is uh, a loss of a gene um, I'm sorry, there's a ex amplification of EGFR in this population, and it sets it apart from the other glioblastomas, which don't have that. This was validated on a subsequent sample of 260 cases, which showed a similar pattern. And so uh, this was uh, allowed classification into four separate classes, but I'll just talk about the classical ones, which have the EGFR mutations. Um, or the proneural group, which is uh, identified primarily by mutations in IDH1. Uh, and I will show you that these are very significantly different tumors with very different behaviors. If we look at the classical subtype, these are patients that are older, that have EGFR uh, high-level amplification, as seen here, and no IDH1 mutations. This is in contrast to the proneural subtypes, which have a high rate of IDH1 mutation here and no consistent EGFR mutations. So these are two very different uh, tumors. And in fact, when one separates these out, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, these actually have different survivals. What we do at our institution and what is done in a similar way at other institutions is looking at the uh, copy number of the, uh, within these various uh, glioblastomas. This would be a classical GBM in an older patient showing polysomy 7. Uh, and here the green show is an amplification of EGFR. There's also loss of CDKN2A on 9P. And there's monosomy 10, uh, as well as monosomy 22. Now, if we zoom in on some of these areas, which we can do in the next slide, we can see the region of polysomy 7 where the EGFR is, is highly amplified, and there's also a V3 mutation. These are important prognostically and uh, uh, have allowed segregation of patient populations for clinical trials. Here's a view, zoomed in view of 9P, which shows a loss uh, of, of part of 9P, including the site for CDKN2A. This is a marker for uh, malignant, uh, I'm sorry, very aggressive behavior. This is in contrast, for example, to a classical oligodendroglioma, which, as I showed you earlier by Fish, has whole arm loss of 1P and whole arm loss of 9Q. So 
We're seeing instead of it as a fluorescent signal in a cell, we're seeing it as a, a hybridization across the a whole genome hybridization in terms of a copy number change. Uh, and this is what we use now for diagnosis. Uh, we only use fish on cases uh, for which we don't have adequate material to do this uh, copy number analysis. And I mentioned in an earlier slide the importance of the proneural phenotype, which showed the IDH mutation, and th that those cases tended to not have the EGFR amplification. So if we separate those cases that have IDH1 mutants, and now we have an immunohistochemical stain for the mutant protein encoded by the mutant IDH1 here so that we can identify IDH1 positive or mutated cells, we see that there is a difference in survival between those that are mutated and those that are wild type. So the IDH1 mutated ones actually do much, much better, very significant way. There are other immunohistochemical stains that we now use in addition to the IDH1, which can help us further classify the different types of tumors and make some more statements about how they may behave. Here I'm showing you an array of diffuse astrocytoma grade 2, anaplastic astrocytoma grade 3, oligoastrocytomas 2 and 3, and oligodendrogliomas 2 and 3. And you can see that based on the expression of P53 by immunohistochemistry or the loss of ATRX by immunohistochemistry, that there's a quite different um, pattern of findings in oligodendrogliomas, which are seen here. These tend to show uh, retention of ATRX staining. ATRX loss is the pathologic state. And uh, instead show not much P53 staining, so that these are quite separate from these other two, uh, which are probably more um, better considered to be really one group rather than uh, uh, two separate groups, uh, and, and importantly to be distinguished from oligodendrogliomas. Now again, one would want to confirm the diagnosis of 1P19Q co-deletion in this group uh, to um, have the complete picture of the, their favorable behavior. If one does this, uh, this is IDH1 mutational status, 1P19Q co-deletion status, ATRX loss or expression, and TP TP53 loss or expression. Again, each one of these parameters shows a distinctive um, survival difference between these two groups. So that current practice is going in the direction that we will start with a diffuse glioma on the basis of the hematoxylin and eosin stain in neuropathology. We will look for the IDH1 or 2 mutation by immunohistochemistry or by other means. And if it's wild type, this will be called a glioblastoma regardless in a way of what the uh, histology looks like because these have uh, an unfavorable genetic profile and usually do very poorly, have less than one year overall survival. Whereas if they have IDH1 or 2 mutations, then depending on whether they have the 1P19Q co-deletion, these will go into another uh, category of oligodendroglioma. Whereas if they don't have it, then they will go into a group of uh, anaplastic astrocytoma um, with further um, delineation into, into subgroups with some different survival, but clearly these have much different survivals when they're separated out in this way than they then do glioblastomas. And this is uh, a, an example of uh, the new algorithm for handling these cases. This will lead, we believe, to an integrated diagnosis for adult diffuse gliomas. Uh, this is an example here of the grade two. Um, and this is from the recently published International Society of Neuropathology Consensus Conference, which was held in Harlem, the Netherlands, in 2014. Um, and what one would hope to do is have the most amount of information here on the top line, um, and with less information here as you go down, so that the degree of certainty is greater here.
and that it's possible that this category of oligoastrocytoma, once one has all of these uh, studies available, will no longer exist, and that instead we will be able to classify them with greater certainty into diffuse astrocytomas uh, or oligodendrogliomas with 1P19Q uh, co-deletion. And the importance of this is that some of these cases, if you don't have the information, they may very well behave more aggressively uh, like a GBM. So this is what's coming down the pike uh, in terms of diagnosis and treatment of glioblastomas. So to summarize, using molecular profiling, uh, we should be able to eventually have some real understanding of the pathogenesis of neoplasia. We would like to have an integrated, that is, histologic and molecular classification of tumors. Uh, and mo most of these studies are being done now at the larger neuro-oncology centers. The point of this is to identify druggable targets and form the basis for new clinical trials, and that this is a, one of the leading areas of um, development of personalized medicine. Now I'd like to quickly go over the um, finding of uh, the importance, rather, of uh, gray matter injury in multiple, in multiple sclerosis. The clinical subtypes have been identified as acute or Marburg type, relapsing remitting, secondary progressive, and primary progressive MS. These have different clinical presentations, as you know, and recently recognized differences in pathologic features have been found. And the most important component of these is the fact that demyelination appears to involve the gray matter to a greater extent than was appreciated before. If we look at the four categories, acute or Marburg, relapsing, remitting, secondary progressive, and primary progressive, and look at various uh, parameters associated with these, we see a couple of things that jump out as being quite different among them. One here is looking at the presence of cortical lesions and the area of the lesions that are present in the forebrain. This was done in a study in 2005 using an uh, immunohistochemical stain to a proteolipid protein, which you see here. This is a control cortex, and there's a fair amount of proteolipid protein up in the cortex. These are the axons either coming up into layer four or projecting down uh, from the projection layers. And you can see here is a plaque that's involving the cortex. And so this plaque area was measured. And one can see that in these different types, there's a vast difference in the area of involvement, so that the worst ones are the primary and secondary progressive, whereas the acute Marburg or the relapsing remitting have comparatively less. In addition, if one looks at inflammatory infiltrates in the meninges in these different subtypes, uh, there is uh, not much difference here, so it's not related so much to that. Uh, but there are some differences in the perivascular white matter infiltrates in these primary and secondary progressive uh, forms. The other thing that was looked at here was the presence of neurofilament protein positive axonal swellings. This is, again, an immunohistochemical stain. Here's a relatively normal axon here, and here's an axonal swelling in, uh, indicative of uh, axonal injury. And when they looked in the normal appearing white matter, they found the number of axonal spheroids in these uh, primary and secondary progressive to be much higher than in the acute or relapsing remitting. So this is a, quite an important and significant difference looking at the involvement of cortical gray matter. When they uh, mapped out the involvement in autopsy cases of this disorder, they mapped out the white matter lesions in green in the acute Marburg variant, or the relapsing remitting, and then the secondary progressive, uh, the green, again, showing the white matter lesions. They also mapped the cortical lesions in orange, not any found here, only a couple here, and then quite a few here in the secondary progressive, and then also in the deep gray matter. So you can see that the burden of plaque involvement, while overall some of the plaques are smaller, the uh, amount of involvement of the brain is, is quite extensive. 
Here these same maps are shown next to a Luxol Fast Blue H&E stained section. Again, these are autopsy cases. This is a section through the temporal pole, the basal ganglia, internal capsule, and you see that there is some ventricular dilatation here with a little bit of pallor in the periventricular white matter indicating a plaque, and here this side shows some increasing pallor as well. Uh, and when one maps out the gray matter plaques here, one can see that there's involvement to this extent, whereas in the um, secondary progressive, there's huge ventricular dilatation and the burden of gray matter disease is very striking. And so that one can appreciate the distinct pathologic differences among these forms in multiple sclerosis. Uh, the active white matter plaques in uh, acute and relapsing are somewhat bigger and more confluent, whereas in the progressive forms, gray matter plaques, even though they are maybe relatively small, uh, form a great burden. Uh, these are increased with the duration of disease and uh, with the overall degree of inflammation. And the degree of axonal injury in what otherwise looks like normal appearing white matter can be profound and is likely the basis for the serious disability in these affected patients. And while gray matter demyelination is not a new finding, the full spectrum with the clinical correlation to cognitive decline is much better recognized now. So I'll close this hour with uh, trends to watch. Immunohistochemistry is becoming more and more important for detection of the expressed protein specific to the disease etiologies and neurodegeneration. And molecular diagnostics are uh, of use in detecting druggable targets in CNS tumors and also in refining the phenotype in neurodegenerative disorders. And directed immunomodulation for specific MS subtypes is determined by advanced MR methods, uh, which may reflect what's actually going on in the gray and white matter, could be of great use. And I want to acknowledge the assistance of my colleagues, Dr. Mel Feeney, Dr. Azra Ligon, Dr. Shaq Ram Kassoon, and Dr. Keith Ligon. Thank you very much.